Uh, firstly, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijay, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'll share my presentation now. And whilst I'm doing that, uh, please feel free if anybody wants to keep your camera open. It's always good to see human faces than blank screen. So please feel free. Uh, no pressure, but if you want to do that, please feel free. So the discussion today is about different strategies for functionalizing non-ovens for medical use. That is the topic, but that is not the purpose of my talk. So what is the purpose? The purpose is the non-ovens uh, industry in general, like uh, many other branches of uh, the, the bigger textile umbrella, we are finding new applications, new uses for textiles. In other words, throughout the world, and I don't take uh, a credit alone for that, all our colleagues are trying to make textiles more functional around the world. And, and today's presentation is just to give a glimpse into that world. It's just to show that it is time for us to think textiles from a different angle to try to do something new, exciting with textiles. And the market demand is there. And towards the end of this presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some slides to substantiate the fact that the demand is there. So it is not an academic exercise. There is seriously industry need for doing the kind of crazy stuff that many of our colleagues do. So if I come back to medical textiles, now, before that, I must say it could have been anything. It could have been medical textiles. It could have been uh, sports textiles. It could have been textiles for architecture. It could have been uh, uh, text geotextiles. I just choose medical textiles uh, to just show the breadth of the research. But there is scope to take it beyond the conventional boundaries of textiles. So if we come back and if we take our focus back to medical textiles, it is really exciting because it's a extensively uh, evolving area. It is kind of changing on a regular basis if you follow the publications in this field. And what we can do with textiles in medical? Well, to start with, we can do wipes. And, and I don't think I need to convince anybody how important role the wipes play because of the COVID to very complex architectures to, to replace, uh, say, for example, bones and tissues. And anything in between can be done with textiles. Now, there are ways of sub-classifying medical textiles. Uh, there are implantable materials like artificial ligaments and stuff that can be done with textiles. Non-implantable materials like wound dressing, hygiene products. I, I've given an example of ostomy pouches. And importantly, the healthcare environment materials, uh, sur surgical grounds, uh, material to reduce hospital acquired infection. We know the importance of that now. And there are other fields as well, right? These three are the main subcategories. Now, what I'm trying uh, very consciously to do today is, is uh, try to give uh, some case studies from, uh, from my research group that I have done with my PhD students or postdocs so that I'm just not talking about hypothetical research of others. I'm trying to talk about what we are doing so that you can get a glimpse of that. So if you uh, uh, first, before I go into the topic, I, I want to discuss the complexities of this subject, right? When you do medical textiles, or, or any other, uh, this kind of thing, automotive textiles or geotextiles. When you do things like that, you need to know two things, right? One, one you need to know textiles because uh, that is what we do. However, say for example, for medical textiles, our textile knowledge is not enough. You need to know about cell culture. You need to know how the biology side of things work. 
So basically what you need to do at and really need to go, uh, become good at that is to do collaborative research. And it is easier said than done. Collaborative research is not just going and chatting with one guy. Collaborative research for me is about becoming humble, is about accepting the fact that I don't know anything or everything and, and going and talking with other people with a humble attitude so that I can contribute something to that subject and I can learn something from others, including our PhD students, including all the students we are working with. And, and that is the fun of it. If we can, if we can find place in our academic practice to be humble and to work with other people and to learn from other people, it, it really becomes a very interesting exercise, very interesting exercise. And I'll try to discuss those with some examples. So firstly, right, uh, obviously COVID uh, in so many different aspects uh, put a mirror in front of our face to look at how we do things. But, but the sustainability drive started before many years uh, uh, before COVID. One example, this is a BBC uh, news article. Uh, I can't remember the year, but it will be written somewhere, 2018, which says wet wipes could face wipeout in plastic cleanup. Now, now, when I saw that news, I, I was genuinely worried. I was worried because it says, uh, if you don't do that, some manufacturers have to develop plastic-free alternative or the consumer have to go without it. Now, let's take a step back and think who is the consumer here? If you are going to a hospital with a headache, and, and if you go to the hospital and, and you get something which is different to that, in other words, if the hospital gives you a disease, that is hospital acquired infection in very simple terms. So the consumer, if we don't manage that inf infection regime properly, the consumer is everybody who is there in the room, everybody who can see, because all of us go to the hospital one day or the other. And we need a protocol to, kill, uh, to, to, to clean the hospitals and wipes is the first line of defense. And probably more than 95% of that industry depends on polypropylene. And it really does a meaningful work. It keeps me and you and your family safe. So if we just have to move from that regime to an unknown world, a lot of research needs to be done. For a long time, uh, me and my colleagues and my research group was doing fundamental work on cellulose science. We are fundamentally trying to understand what goes on with cellulose under different chemical treatment regime, what kind of uh, crystalline changes happen, how we can functionalize it. And we genuinely thought that we need to do something about it. We need to come up with uh, solutions for this problem. Now, uh, I was, if I'm not totally wrong, the, the student who did this work is actually present today. So I must acknowledge that this work was done by him. I was his PhD uh, supervisor and his, his uh, background was not textiles when he started doing the PhD. And uh, uh, I think Nick is here today. I thought I have seen him nevertheless, right? Now, when he first joined the group, he was not from a textile background. He came from a completely different background, and, but he was a very clever lad. So we worked together and we worked with NHS to do some very fundamental work. Uh, uh, you are welcome, Nick. Uh, and thanks for joining today. So what he did, 
he took some cellulose wipe made out of, out of lyocell and he functionalized that using plasma treatment. So basically he changed the surface energy of that fabric. And the, then he did some analytical work. I don't want to uh, uh, go into details of that. It's boring, but he changes the surface roughness of the material. He quantified that, so on and so forth. What was the purpose of that work? He and us wanted to critically understand how the bacteria interact, how that microorganisms interact with fibers as a factor of the surface energy, as the factor of the surface roughness, so on and so forth. And how this is different to when it interacts, uh, when it interacts with uh, Uh, when it interacts with uh, uh, I just lost the flow. Sorry, give me a second. When it interacts with polypropylene and what happens when it interacts with cellulose and what happens when you functionalize cellulose to change their surface energy. We quantified that. And that is not only where he stopped he did some more work on that field. We, in fact, after uh, he, he finished his PhD and, and joined a brilliant job, we continued that work so that we can fundamentally understand how we can even change the fiber morphology at a, at a commercially relevant scale to make that process work even better. So it's a flow of information, flow of knowledge coming from one PhD student, two postdocs, two other PhD students, but we are creating that ecosystem where we can try to solve the real life problems. Now, if you want to read any of these papers, uh, they are published online. Uh, I'm giving reference to that papers. Feel, please feel free to have a look at them. So in this particular one, we are using ionic liquid to completely change the porous structure of the fibers. And, and that will probably create more interactions with whatever things we want the fiber to interact with. The challenge for today, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, if there is any students here, try to think where you can apply the same knowledge in other fields. Think beyond medical textiles. And that is the fun of non ovens because you can use the same kind of set of machines to produce material for so many different applications. And some of this, what we are doing for one application can easily be transferable to other applications. And that is the fun of it, that thinking process, that, that framework, how you think around non ovens Let's go to a completely different project, right? Uh, Let's, let's define the problem. In Europe, and, and I'm, I'm actually disclosing data from what, 20, 2013, probably last time when I checked. In UK, 120,000 peop uh, people live, live with a condition called, uh, 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 with an with a ostomy pouch. That means they have a stoma in their, in their stomach. What is stoma? People who have bowel cancer, their large intestine is taken out of their stomach and the human waste can come out in that bag at any time. And the bag will get full and you'll need to find a way of discarding that waste. There are three types of stoma and it's a very big problem if you look worldwide. And this is how it looks like. So the bowel is taken out of your stomach. Human waste can come out at any point. Quite expensive for NHS to maintain this. Uh, 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 more than 360 million each year in England. Uh, NHS spends on stoma. Uh, it's a growing problem. There are more cases of bowel cancer. Uh, there are good news as well. The mortality rate is falling. 
but population is increasing, life expectancy is increasing. So to conclude the problem, we can safely assume will go bigger with time. What is the problem with it? Now, now think about it, right? It means, it means you are used to a normal toilet practice and suddenly you have an operation and your human waste can come out at any time. It's a plastic bag. You are going to a relative's house. Uh, uh, middle of the evening, the human waste comes out and you need to find a way to discard that waste. Probably using their normal bin. Not the most uh, uh, socially uh, uh, appreciable situation to be in. So somebody came to us and, and let's take another step back, right? If you take that bag, and if it goes to your normal household waste into landfill, uh, in UK alone, uh, there are 36.5 million used stomers that are thrown out primarily to the landfill. There are things in human waste, tapeworms, hookworms, and all sorts, which can survive up to 10 years. And therefore, it is creating an environmental hazard as well. So what can be the ideal solution to this problem? One might be that uh, we try to develop a product where the patients can kind of practice a normal toilet practice through this exercise. So if the human waste is coming out in the bag and if that bag can be taken to the toilet and flushed out like normally we do, then probably the patients will get a close to a normal life. What is the challenge? To achieve that, you need to hold the human waste in a fabric. So the fabric needs to be hydrophobic, or should I say super hydrophobic? But at the same time, that super hydrophobic need to disperse in water. Quite a serious challenge, and this is what we did. As you can see, we developed a non-oven, which is super hydrophobic. But when you put it in a given amount of water under given amount of mechanical action, the fabric disperses into single fibers. So a reverse engineering happens and all the material that we are using is biodegradable. We have done the test. So at last by using this intervention, we can actually make a serious real difference in a lot of people's life. And we are trying to understand how to commercialize that. Now, from, from that, where we are, we are trying to develop a product which goes outside the patient's uh, body, we can actually use textiles to make real differences for the patient, real life medical problems. Let's take this example. Uh, people who have a kidney disease uh, or, or a chronic kidney disease what they have to do is they have to go for dialysis every so often. What dialysis does, dialysis use some filter to clean your blood. If your kidney can't do it, dialysis machine tries to do that. And there are different forms of dialysis. However, there are 150 kinds of toxins reported last time I checked and dialysis can't remove all of them. So if you look at uramic toxins, there are water soluble, low molecular weight toxins. Dialysis is very good for them. There are middle molecular weight molecules. Dialysis can somehow remove them. Protein bound 
macromolecules, dialysis can't remove them with a degree of efficiency. So that builds up in your body and it might give you, if not anything, a cardiovascular disease. So that is why for a chronic kidney disease, sometimes the best way to treat that is to do a kidney transplant. So we did a large body of work where, where we tried to functionalize textile materials with targeted molecules that can target given toxins and remove them from your blood. And we developed it in a way that you can actually incorporate that into normal dialysis machines. Again, using textiles to solve absolutely real life medical problems. And then that scope of textiles improves and there are so many other things you can do. You can, we already know textiles are used a lot for uh, wound dressing and other things. We are working strategically now so that we can make wound dressing uh, with, with say food byproduct. This is one published paper where we have tried to use methyl glyoxal, uh, a, a, a ingredient in maluka honey, and we functionalized textiles with that. And that way we made a, a, a completely biodegradable uh, antibacterial agent. And we have characterized and published that work. As I said, the normal model, we didn't stop there. We continued that piece of work. We even did a lot of different work. For example, a, a, a huge problem in wound dressing is try to understand how, how the dressing fits around complex curves like this one. So we even worked with the American University uh, jointly with a master's student to develop new characterization techniques uh, for wound dressing in that kind of situation. So we are trying to build a portfolio of work so that we can meaningfully contribute to that subject area rather than just doing some academic work. Similar kind of concept, you can take it forward. We can functionalize. This is another published piece of work where we are trying to create textiles with very complex architecture uh, to replace, say, heart tissues. In this work, for example, you can see we developed a fabric with self-assembly peptide. And, and the architecture of this particular fibrous geometry is very complex. You have quite uh, like submicron fibers. Also, you have uh, nanofibers less than 100 uh, nanometer in diameter. Why we are creating that kind of complex fibrous architectures so that the degradation profile inside the bioenvironment can be catered, can be manipulated, can be changed. One fiber degrades more quickly, leaving the actives, other ones not so fast. And we can actually control the release dynamics following that process. Again, continued that piece of work did a lot of work, including, but not limited to, trying to use similar kind of concept to load uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients into textiles and then manipulating the delivery of that. It means uh, there is serious need to do that kind of work. And I, I, I'll touch on that a bit later on as well. S same concept. Now, this is really important because the same concept that we are discussing previously, actually the principle, the academic fundamentals of those work can be used to solve real life textile problems for the bigger textile industry. In 2013, around 2012, 2013, we realized there is a direction of travel where, uh, where fluorochemicals will, will slowly get banned from textile production and you know the journey where it is going. So we started working on that and, and we developed interventions. For example, this one. We, 
where we developed breathable, stretchable membranes. Uh, uh, as you can see, it is very stretchable. This is just a visual representation where the fabric is here. You can see it is hydrophobic, as in the water is not passing through it, but the air is easily passing through it. So it is hydrophobic but breathable, done without using any fluorochemistry. Uh, it is done using electrospinning, but other polymer-led non-ovens can be used to do this. Uh, you will appreciate that. However, then we, are, we used another toolbox. Uh, we used nanoparticles. Here we are giving an example of nano silver, but we can use other forms of nanoparticles or hybrid nanoparticles to functionalize that. And we develop the fabric in a way that it creates a lot of frictional resistance with the skin. It means if you see the normal available uh, silicon-based uh, frictional resistance fabrics. It is actually giving two or three times better property than that. Silicon don't work very well when it is wet, creating a lot of problems. Our This particular fabric actually works better when it is wet because the way it is designed and how the nanoparticle distribution was controlled. Obviously, we use silver, so it is antimicrobial, but we can use other actives, as I just said. And we patented that technology. We are trying to commercialize it now. It started with that fluorochemical kind of problem. So we didn't stop at that work. We actually tried to critically understand what is wrong. Why can't textile industry move out from uh, fluorochemicals? So we actually did some other work where we characterize different kind of uh, finishes on textiles. And we actually went out and talked with the consumers of what they want in outdoor garments. So trying to do uh, uh, within our limitation as much as holistic research as possible so that we can make some difference. Now, healthcare, right? and and. Trust me, if you think about it, you will find a kind of similar thing in every field where you will see that textiles going forward will play a huge role in so many different fields. So why it is so important to, to study medical textiles? Now, now think about the simplest situation possible, right? You are having a headache. I mean, uh, today it is pretty hot in UK. So uh, uh, I am actually, I'm not making it up. I'm actually having a headache today. Now, now, what I'll do now, once I finish this lecture, I'll go and have uh, some kind of medicine to stop this headache, like a Calpol or something. Now I'll have 500 milligram of that, say for example. Now, if Nick is still there, I, I'm taking Nick's reference because I know he's here. Uh, Nick is a, a very fit guy, right? He, he, he's kind of a bodybuilder and I'm fat and ugly. But both of us, if we go to the doctor, uh, they will give us 500 milligrams of the same tablet. Now, being a very fit and thin guy, Nick probably, it will be toxic for Nick because he will need just this much. Being fat and ugly, I'll need this much. So, it will be ineffective to me and it will be toxic for Nick. Now textiles can solve that because we can load drugs into textiles. If we can do that, and I have discussed with a few examples, we can actually very sincerely cater how the drug gets delivered to the body. So based on your BMI, you can actually cut the fabric and put it in your skin. So. 
a small example, we can make that example as complex as you want, and we can talk about what happens when, when uh, our, our brain tumor is surgically removed from your brain and how textiles can help in that situation, but sky is the limit. And I genuinely believe that a lot of research will be directed in this direction. I was part of a 9.8 million pound project, which is called Grow Med Tech, which recently finished. And a lot of interventions like that we looked into. We critically tried to do it. We are applying for more funding on that. And you know what? As a community, as a textile community, we can make a real difference if we take it seriously. And, and I genuinely believe we have to do it. And we have to do it forgetting about what is our boundaries, because it only helps when we do meaningful invention and innovations. We have to come together. Grow MedTech is a consortium between six universities. And we have to form that collaboration between subject groups, with other subject groups, and we have to make it happen. Now, I am so pleased to know that whatever I'm saying for that many years and, and, and uh, my other colleagues before me, that even Indian government is taking seriously. This is a document published uh, by Indian government, Future of Textiles, Technical Textiles. India government is going to invest 1.4 trillion US dollars in infrastructural development. And I promise you, textiles can make a contribute in each of them. In fact, I had a project with uh, a global challenge project with India where we are trying to, we were trying to develop water filtration membranes. Uh, arsenic is a big problem in some parts of India. So it is actually time to be excited at, as textile people because we can make our market size even bigger and we can make serious contributions uh, with what we know. And this journey will continue. Uh, this is another example uh, that not too, simil too dissimilar to things I was talking about. We can take that, we can take one thing that we are developing for medical technologies and try to implement it in other fields. This is a patent I applied with Adidas, uh, with other colleagues, where we are trying to make uh, food, sh food uh, sorry, not food, uh, uh, sports uh, materials with single component, uh, uh, single component uh, composites. Uh, this is the patent application with Adidas. So just to trying to take it to a conclusion, I genuinely believe that this is the time where as textile professionals, textile academics, textile industry, we have to think how to make our boundary porous, interdisciplinary, work with other fields, try to learn from them, try to contribute in that field. But eventually, we have to make that boundary, even the porous boundary disappear we have to create new areas. Uh, let's look at a small cross-section of the team I work with. There are only a few people from textiles. Majority of them, some, uh, they have background in cancer drug development as in their PhD. Some are computational chemists. Some are mechanical engineers. Some are coming from civic society so that we can identify the problem. We try to work together to make some difference. And we take it outside the university boundary as well. This is one example of a project where, where I'm part of, I'm the co-investigator, one of the four co-investigators, a project between Huddersfield University, Royal College of Art and University of Leeds, where I used to work before. It is called Future Fashion Factory and it is sponsored by AHRC. It is a 5.4 million pound project where we are working, I think the latest number is we are working around 360 companies. We are not just doing exciting academic work, but I'm proud to say we are doing work that will have serious commercial footprint. 
And this is how we need to think. We need to think of our subject area. We need to think why it is exciting, how to make it more exciting by collaborating with others, not to work in a dark room uh, alone as an academic. It's about opening our boundaries. And if you work with us, uh, I mean the industry, we have different models uh, to work with the industry. Uh, we have licensing model that we can do. We generate IP. Uh, uh, we, we give you the freedom of operation under some commercial framework. And there are a lot of that kind of framework that we can use uh, for our research that relates to some kind of impact. I genuinely hope uh, I'm, I'm able to give a glimpse into what we do. It was beyond the scope to discuss it in more details, but I just wanted to give a glimpse of why textile can be very exciting. Thank you so much.